Hello, my name is Vikan Boskert. I'm a heart failure cardiologist, professor of medicine, senior dean of faculty, and director of Winter Center for Heart Failure Research at Baylor College of Medicine. Today, we're discussing tips for optimizing guideline-directed medical therapy in heart failure. I want to talk about optimization strategies according to stages of heart failure in clear steps according to ejection fraction classification. In the 2022 ACC, AHA, HFSA practice guidelines in heart failure, we have specific recommendations according to stages of heart failure. We revise the stages terminologies for these to be better understood by our patients and by non-specialists. First stage is patients with risk factors such as diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and obesity, but without symptoms or signs or functional or structural cardiac abnormalities. We define this as stage A or at risk for heart failure. The second stage is patients without symptoms or signs, but with structural, functional, or biomarker abnormality. And this stage is called pre-heart failure or stage B. Patients with current or prior symptoms of heart failure are called stage C or symptomatic heart failure. And patients with advanced symptoms or signs with high risk features such as repeated hospitalizations or intolerance to GDMT is defined as advanced heart failure or stage D. We have specific recommendations for each stage. We also have a classification according to ejection fraction because of the existing evidence for treatment according to different ejection fraction classifications. Let's go over these EF classifications. Patients with EF less than or equal to 40% are classified as heart failure with reduced EF. EF between 41 and 49% as mildly reduced EF, and EF exceeding that of 50% as preserved EF. We also have a new category in the guidelines defined as heart failure with improved EF. These are patients with history of ejection fraction less than 40%, whose EF may have improved to more than 40% with treatment. And these individuals need to be continued on GDMT despite resolution of symptoms or normalization of EF. Now let's go over the steps of guideline-directed medical therapies in symptomatic heart failure patients with reduced EF. First step is initiation of quadruple therapy. And these include SGLT2 inhibitors, beta blockers, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, and RAS inhibition with either ARNI in NYHA class 2 to 3 or ACE inhibitors or ARP in NYHA class 2 to 4 heart failure patients. These medications have been demonstrated to result in significant improvement in cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization as early as 30 days after initiation. Therefore, Timely initiation is critical to prevent adverse outcomes. Newer agents such as RNA and SGLT2 inhibitors have uh, beneficial effects also in the kidney. They slow the decline in EGFR and they also improve quality of life. So they are effective not only in cardiovascular disease, but also in renal outcomes and improving patient reported outcomes. These medications are safe when compared against comparator or placebo and can be safely initiated pre-discharge. In the guidelines, we specify that all four classes can be initiated simultaneously at low doses, or alternatively, these medications may be started sequentially, but with the sequence guided by clinical factors, not necessarily according to the historical uh, way that the trials were conducted. And these medications can be initiated um, in a way that the target dose optimization can be done simultaneously without waiting for the prior medication to achieve the optimal dose. In clinical practice, sequence can be individualized according to patient etiologies. For example, in the outpatient setting for a patient with 
active ischemia or tachycardia, beta blockers may be prioritized. For a patient with advanced chronic kidney disease, SGLT2 inhibitors may be prioritized, followed up by ARNI. For a patient with significant congestion, NYHA class 3 symptoms with recurrent hospitalizations, after diuretics, SGLT2 inhibition, ARNI, and MRA may be prioritized, and then followed with beta blockade. The step two is for the target doses of the four classes of medication doses to be increased to target doses as tolerated. We have evidence of better outcomes, especially with beta blocker and ACE inhibitor dose optimization. If we examine the number of dose titrations required for each class, it should be noted that SGLT2 inhibition is only one standard dose. An MRA may require only one or two steps for optimization of doses, and ACE inhibitors and beta blockers may require two to three steps. But regardless, the maximum tolerated dose should be achieved in a few encounters, in two to three encounters, and not delayed beyond four to six weeks. Please also keep in mind that the new agents, such as SGLT2 inhibitors and ARNI, have a safe profile on the kidney, as well as potassium levels and they facilitate and enable initiation and continuation of other agents, such as mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. Steps three and four are further to optimize therapy if patients remain symptomatic. Hydralazine and nitrates are indicated in African-American black patients, and device therapies such as ICD and CRT should be considered for indicated patients. ICD is indicated in patients with reduced EF, less than 35%, and CRT in patients with symptomatic heart failure with EF, less than 35%, and wide QRS. Step five is to consider additional therapies, such as ivabradine in symptomatic patients with heart failure with reduced EF, with a heart rate exceeding that of 70 beats per minute despite maximum dose of beta blockers. Verisiguat can be considered in symptomatic patients with recent heart failure hospitalizations or elevated nitrotepeptide levels. Digoxin can be considered in symptomatic heart failure patients. Polyunsaturated fatty acids in heart failure patients with NYHA class 2 to 4 heart failure symptoms. And potassium binders can be considered in patients with hyperkalemia while taking RAS inhibitors. Additionally, in the guidelines, we have specified that surgical revascularization is indicated among select patients with suitable coronary anatomy and ischemic cardiomyopathy, and transcatheter edge to edge mitral valve repair to be considered among patients with secondary MR, suitable anatomy, EF between 20 to 50%, with left ventricular and systolic dimension less than 70 mm and PA systolic pressures less than 70 mm mercury after optimization of guideline directed therapy. It's critical to remember that guideline-directed medical therapy should be optimized before consideration of intervention for secondary MR. In the guidelines, we also have specific recommendations for patients with heart failure with mildly reduced EF, as well as preserved EF. We have evidence from two large-scale trials that SGLT2 inhibitors are effective in reducing cardiovascular mortality and heart failure hospitalizations, in all patients with EF greater than 40%. These include patients with mildly reduced EF and preserved EF. Thus, SGLT2 inhibitors have a higher level of recommendation for treatment of patients with mildly reduced EF or preserved EF than other medications. After SGLT2 inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, Beta blockers, mineral cortical receptor antagonists can be considered for patients in mildly reduced EF. ARNI, ARB, or MRA can be considered in patients with heart failure with preserved EF. Please note that beta blockers are not indicated in patients with heart failure with preserved EF, though they are commonly used for other indications in patients with heart failure with preserved EF, such as for ischemic heart disease or for atrial fibrillation rate control, we do not have any evidence of benefit with beta blockers in patients with heart failure with preserved EF. The next treatment uh, step is treatment of comorbidities. We have specific recommendations to screen for iron deficiency in all heart failure patients and 
treatment of iron deficiency with IV iron to improve symptoms, functional capacity, and quality of life. Hypertension should be optimally treated according to guidelines. We recommend SGLT2 inhibition for management of hyperglycemia in patients with diabetes and heart failure regardless of ES. This is a separate recommendation than the indication of SGLT2 inhibitors for patients for treatment of heart failure with reduced EF. So for treatment of hyperglycemia of patients with heart failure and diabetes, the SGLT2 inhibitors are recommended as a class one indication. We also have recommendations for consideration of atrial fibrillation ablation in patients with atrial fibrillation and symptoms attributable to atrial fibrillation. Heart failure outcomes, unfortunately, are very similar to that of cancer, and there is an urgency not to delay the therapies in this deadly disease. For this reason, I use the analogy of calling the initiation of quadruple therapy in patients with heart failure with reduced EF the induction therapy. And I consider additional therapies as consolidation therapy to alert the clinicians to the importance of timely initiation and optimization of therapies in heart failure. Keep in mind that we have strong evidence that implementation can be enhanced when therapies are initiated before discharge in patients hospitalized for heart failure. Initiation pre-discharge and optimization within two weeks post-discharge is effective and safe. There's also evidence that hybrid models involving optitration with virtual telehealth or multidisciplinary care coordination approaches are effective. Electronic health records can also help optimize guideline-directed therapy implementation at the network level. With such coordinated efforts, we hope that these disease-modifying therapies would effectively be implemented and change the trajectory of this deadly disease that is affecting more than 6 million adults in the United States. Thank you for your attention.